Welcome to Political Jungle. I'm your guide, Steve Irwin, and at least once each week, we meet a herd of animals in this jungle. Like today, some of our guests are of the species that's risen to the top of the food chain, those who've run for political office and in many cases won the most votes. But we also meet the operatives behind the scenes, campaign managers, press secretaries, legislative aides, fundraisers, party officials, pollsters, schedulers, to name a few. And we talk not only to those who are in the hunt now, but those who've been through the game and pursued other paths. This is not your typical Sunday morning survey of the issues. If you're a wonk looking for meaty policy analysis, you may leave a little hungry. Rather, our prey is the person, the animal himself. Who is this individual? Who inspires her? What motivates him? What makes him sweat? What keeps her up at night? Where has she been? Where does he dream about going? So often we go into the voting booth and vote not on the candidate's stands, but on the candidate's character. Who we think she is down deep. Is she a good person? Would we want to be friends with him? Go out for dinner with her? Do they see what we see when they look at the world we live in? Political Jungle aspires to give you a more intimate sense of these folks. If you're curious about a life in politics, we hope you come away with a deeper understanding of the diversity of opportunities and the many trails you can travel to get there. political and track star, centrist former congressman, blue dog, debut author, Jason Altmaier, welcome to The Political Jungle. Thank you for having me, Steve. It's great to see you. It's great to have you back in Western Pennsylvania, Jason. Yeah. We miss you. Uh, we're going to talk. Let's uh, bring everyone up to date. We'll start, though, in 1968, the year you were born. An important year. A lot happened in that year. Yeah. Uh, RFK was shot and Martin Luther King. Czechoslovakia, the Russians uh, entered Czechoslovakia. Yeah. There must have been something in the soil that got you interested in politics. Yeah, um, March of 68 is when I was born. I actually spent the first six years of my life up to 73, so five years, in Detroit. And then my mother brought me back to Pittsburgh, um, where she was from and her family was from. And uh, grew up in Pittsburgh, went to Borough High School out in Lower Borough. Lower Borough. Yeah, so uh, that was, those were my formative years. Wow. Uh, and now, did you, your mom, you were a, uh, a single, you didn't have any brothers or sisters? No. Nope. And you, your Only mom. Only child, single parent. Single parent. Yeah. Uh, from the time you were born? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty, very impressive. Yeah, and, she, and she was a special ed teacher. Okay. So she was pretty remarkable. She dealt with a lot of uh, different situations throughout her life and was, was pretty good at dealing with people. Hmm. Does, uh, now, your, your, your uh, ethnic background, you're German, Scotch-Irish on one side and Polish on the other? It's funny. I just took one of those tests, those on, uh, yeah. you see on TV, like 23 right? Like 23 something. Yeah. And I got it back. Yeah, that's what it was. And um, I was one quarter all around Europe. So one quarter from each part of Europe. Interesting. So some stuff we didn't uh, we didn't expect, but that's what I am. So I'm kind of everything European. Well, then you were very comfortable when you came back to Pittsburgh. That's right. Right. Because that's what Pittsburgh is exactly. So uh, now, somewhere you went to Lower Burrell Elementary and yeah, all the way through. All the way through. Yeah. So which high school did you go to? Burrell High School. Burrell High School. Yeah. Okay. And what was the name of the team in, in, at Burrell? Buccaneers. Okay, the Burrell Buccaneers. Burrell Bucks. Okay. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And. Uh, you were uh, uh, very successful at track, right? You ran, what was your event? Jumps. High jump, triple jump, long jump. 
and I held the school record in the triple jump for a fairly long time. Somebody mm -hmm. ended up breaking it okay. you know, eventually, but yeah, at the jumps and track, and then I did football, and for a little bit I did basketball. Okay, and yeah. football, you were, you were a wide receiver, right? Right. Um, and, uh, but you were injured, so you actually had to go to school not to play football, at least when you left. Well, I went to Florida State with the intention of walking on to the team at Florida State because mm -hmm. they were known to accept walk-ons and be favorable to that. So I went to Florida State in 1986, I matriculated, and it took me, I missed three football seasons, my senior year of high school and then my first two in college, but I did make the team. As a junior um, at Florida State? I was a school junior, but I was a sophomore okay. in football because you can count one year as a red shirt. But yeah, made the team. My problem as a wide receiver, two things. Coming off an ACL tear in the mid-1980s, it just wasn't as good. I wasn't as quick and fast as I had been before, so I just, I just wasn't quite as good. But mm -hmm. I had to work every day in practice as a wide receiver against a defensive back named Deion Sanders. <laughs> so you're trying to make an impression, right? You're a mm -hmm. walk-on. You want to do something and show yourself right. and, and show what you can do, but how are you ever going to do that? The fastest Deion man Sanders? on earth. That's been right. not, not easy. Right, yeah. which is why nobody realizes that I ever played football <laughs> because Deion was, he was... And it was an amazing experience, and, and working against him was was um, really life-changing because it showed me the difference in talent and there's some things some people are meant to do and some things you might want to do that maybe you're not quite cut out to do. So it, it was a learning experience, but after working against him, running for Congress was child's play. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> were you, did you actually, when you were in, in grade school and otherwise, did you actually want to be a football player? Or did, when did you start to sort of get well, this interest in politics? Well, I grew up in Pittsburgh in the 70s, right? So yeah. everybody at that point was into football as right. they are today. And, and yeah, that, that was like every kid, that was my dream. But I, I mm -hmm. took it as far as I could. And while I was in college, I decided that uh, political science was of interest to me, so I, I was a business major, and I switched my major to political science because mm -hmm. I was interested in it, and that was what I graduated in. Okay, and then from there you went to work uh, on the campaign of Pete Peterson for Congress. Right, Pete Peterson, who's been in the news lately because of Ken Burns' amazing documentary on the Vietnam War. Pete Peterson was a six-and-a-half-year POW yeah. in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. He ran for Congress in his mid-50s in 1990. And the story I tell about how I met him and got on that campaign is I was in my last class on my last day at mm -hmm. Florida State. And I always tell this when I speak to students, mm -hmm. right, especially college students. And I was leaving the school. I had my car packed. I was ready to drive back to Pittsburgh. I had applied to law school. I had a summer job lined up. And I'm thinking about my future. And the professor calls out to me, hey, Jason, I want you to uh, come here. I want to talk to you about something. And she said, there's a political campaign going on. This guy's running for Congress against an incumbent. He's a Democrat running against the Republican. He has no chance to win, mm -hmm. but I think you'd be good at it. And um, if you wanted to, I could put in a good word with the campaign. And I said, well, I've got a job lined up. I, you know, going to school, I, I, I just can't. I can't. And uh, she said, well, but you can do that anyway. This is a really good experience. It would give you some work experience. I really think it's your calling. I think you'd be good at it. You ought to do it. Uh -huh. So in the time it took me to walk back to my car, I decided I'm going to go for this. So worked on his campaign. He worked all the way through, and he won. And he won. He won yeah. the race and brought me up to Washington, started my whole career. And the kicker to the story is on that campaign, I met my now wife Kelly. Mm -hmm. We had not met before. She was a year behind me, a student at Florida State. So what I tell the students is that whole, you know, we, we now have two teenage daughters and we've been married for 21 years. Mm -hmm. And I tell um, students, you know, you never know what the formative moment of your life is going to be. And for me, that was it. And mm -hmm. I had no idea, but it happened because I took a risk mm -hmm. and I was willing to, you know, an informed risk. I was willing to set aside the immediacy of what I had lined up for the potential of something more long-term, and it worked out very well yep. in every way. And at the time you did that, kids who were teenagers weren't taking a gap year or time off. I mean, that was really unusual to do that. You, you sort of went straight from one thing to the next, and uh, you did take a risk and obviously worked out pretty pretty well. You, yeah. um, and you uh, were with Congressman Peterson for his three for three terms well, and right. before he went to become the ambassador to Vietnam. Right. And uh, while you were there, you also worked uh, with uh, President Clinton on the, uh, his health care reform task force. 
That's another issue. Uh, I worked with Pete and he assigned me the health care issue. I didn't know anything about it, had no interest or knowledge of it, coming right out of college, and it ended up becoming my career. Yeah. And, I, and I've been pretty successful with it. So um, again, that story, uh, it really changed the entire path of my life in a very <clears throat> positive way because I took that risk. Well, you, you got to avoid law school. Instead, you went yeah, to exactly. GW and uh, at George Washington, you got a master's in health administration. Yeah. Did exactly. you do that while you were working at in night, Congress? Night school, yeah. Took me four years, but well worth it. And GW is one of the top schools for that. So where, where did you go uh, after you were in Congress? You became a lobbyist. I came back to Pittsburgh for a job yeah. at UPMC, where I worked for seven years. I started in 1998 and left in 2005. And during that time, I worked on their government relations and their community affairs. That's when we first met, back at a, a, a victory party for Harris Wofford. I think it was a, which it was either a victory party or a very sad night. Is yeah. one of the two. It was a party. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, the so uh, and other things you did in Pittsburgh. I, I have to mention, of course, that you were in Leadership Pittsburgh's LDI Leadership yeah. Development Initiative with some great folks, yeah. including my wife Andy. Yeah, that's for uh, Andy and I met. And uh, Jake Wheatley, who has been on the show, yeah. has been in the political jungle, and uh, Dan Henderson and Michael Coleman, who's in D.C., I think, doing some interesting yeah. things. Yeah, there were Did some you, good folks in that class. Yeah. Uh, so at some point you decided that you were going to run for Congress. And I remember a conversation when you, so we sat and had lunch, and you laid out for, for me the numbers, and you were very much into the numbers and understood why you could be successful. Why don't you talk about that decision run for Yeah, it's interesting. After the two, I, I actually tell the story in, in my book in some detail, but in, uh, after the 2004 elections, regardless of your politics, right, I looked at the outcome and I thought uh, Melissa Hart was the representative in the district where I lived, and uh, I just thought she was too far to the right to be you know, I, want, I thought we needed a more mainstream conservative, yes, but more centrist member mm -hmm. of Congress than I felt her voting record was. And I spent about six months traveling around the district, which I had gotten to know pretty well because of my job at UPMC, which was primarily external affairs, and explaining to people why I thought she was beatable. And at the time, she was 42 years old, mm -hmm. uh, had never lost an election, had been in public office for 16 years, counting her state senate, and everyone assumed she was going to go on to higher things. And every single person I talked to said, you're crazy. You can't beat Melissa. Nobody can beat Melissa Hart. I mean, mm -hmm. she's popular. And uh, I, there were 538 voting precincts. And I think what you're referring to is I literally went through all 538, and her past two opponents had gotten 36% against her. Mm -hmm. which to me meant to beat her, you have to flip 7% of the vote, right? Mm -hmm. That's Take an optimist. Take seven yeah. from him, or seven from her, right. and give seven to her opponent. Um, so I went through every district and figured out how to do that. So to make a long story short, I went back to Kelly and I said, you know, my wife, and I said, no one is going to do this, so I think that I'm, I'm going to do this. this. This is something that I feel like uh, needs to be done. And she said, well, what does that mean? I said, it means I'm going to quit my job at UPMC. We had four and six maybe were our kids, or three and five really young kids. And I'm going to spend the next 18 months traveling around the district, 146 towns, campaigning for a seat that nobody thinks I can win, mm -hmm. and nobody's going to pay any attention to it. And she said, I, I don't really like that plan. I don't think that's good. <laughs> and the way I, uh, I won the argument was, it wasn't an argument, but the discussion was I said, look, a year and a half from now the election's going to occur, and we're going to be watching the results and we're going to see somebody else either come really close to beating her or maybe beating her. And I'm going to know I could, that could have been me. I could have done that, but nobody else is going to know. And I'm going to be sitting at a bar when I'm 85 years old saying, hey, I could have been a congressman yeah. if only I... So I went back to that first risk that I took, and I thought, you know, you're never going to succeed if you don't take risk along the way. So. How'd you feed the family for job. the for Well, the six Kelly months. had a job. Um, she worked for AARP, and we lived off right. of that. We canceled our cable mm -hmm. uh, for that, that whole time. We only had the, the <laughs> channels without cable, and we ate macaroni and cheese and rigatoni and all of that. Uh, 
it ended up working out. But yeah. even if it had, even if I had lost my first race and it was very close, uh, it still would have been the best experience of my life. I still would have been glad that I did it because you meet people and you learn about issues and you learn about the region and so many great towns in that district in Beaver County and Lawrence County and just character towns and the people that you meet become lifetime friends. So yeah. I, I still would have enjoyed it. And now when you're 85, like my dad, who's in the studio today watching uh, up from Florida for my daughter's bat mitzvah, uh, you'll be able to say that you were a congressman for three terms. Right, right. Uh, the, after, after Congress, um, you went to Florida, and you had went to the Florida Blues, which is the equivalent of Highmark, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's the Blue Cross Blue Shield plan for the entire state of Florida. Unlike Pennsylvania, which has three different blues plans, Florida has one. So mm -hmm. it's the largest insurer in the third largest state. It's a $15 billion company. And um, Kelly, my wife, is from Florida. We met at Florida State. I, I like Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, and it just, they made me uh, a nice offer that, right. that was something that was appealing to us. We had no intention of leaving Pittsburgh, we loved it here, our kids loved it here, but it just was, it was the right thing to do. And the job that I had was basically external affairs, traveling around the state, talking about healthcare, talking about politics. I ran a $260 million foundation. So everywhere from Key West to Pensacola, if mm -hmm. you know Florida, everywhere, uh, we had over 600 partners in the community that we were giving money to. So traveling around and meeting these people who were every day helping other people, it was, it was, it was a very good job. Well, I grew up down there, so I know the geography pretty well, but I guess, you know, it, it equals out. I came up here and you're down there, so yeah, it's all exactly. good. Um, now, I want, I want to talk a little bit about um, the end of your congressional career, but when we get into a deep dive, which is the next Part of the part of the show, and uh, let's first talk about um, inspiration. Who inspired you? Obviously, Pete Peterson was one of the folks who had a big influence. He's on the you. one, yeah, definitely. Because what, when you're 18 years old, and you know, I had the knee injury, which which affected me, and I, I thought I got a raw deal from fate for that, you know. And, and and you hear someone who was a POW for six and a half years, and yeah. I, I was his driver, right? That's all I did, and. Uh, he, occasionally he would open up about that and you think and he'd had some other tragedies in his life and and uh, it really puts in perspective what's important right and, and what what is life-changing and what is just bad luck mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the fact that he was able to overcome it and then over time he not only became a congressman but he, when he left office he became the first ambassador to Vietnam yeah. first US ambassador to unified Vietnam after the war and to have had the experience that he had, where he was literally tortured and then had to go sit across the table from his former interrogators who tortured him yes. in a diplomatic role representing the, the country and do it in, in, in an outstanding way that even President Bush kept him on after he became mm -hmm. president, it just shows you the kind of character that he had. So he's definitely far and away the most inspiring person I've met. One of the things that inspires me about him is he now lives in Australia. Melbourne. And, yeah, and he's an Australian citizen. Yeah. Which is uh, extraordinary. Have you been, have you seen him since? Or? I haven't. We were going to, his first wife passed away while he was in office and he met an Australian diplomat, which mm -hmm. is why he lives right. in Australia while he was in Vietnam. And we were invited to the wedding in Vietnam, but Kelly was pregnant at the time with Natalie, who's now our almost 19 year old daughter. And um, there were travel restrictions on pregnant women, you know, going to Vietnam at the time. Yeah. So we kind we kind of regret that we didn't do that. I mean, it was probably good that we didn't, but that was our opportunity. Just an aside, um, you'll be find this interesting. Uh, so, Jim and Nora Eisenhower, that, Nora yeah. who ran AARP, which Kelly worked for, right. and were, they worked together. Their daughter, uh, Annie, who you'll remember, yeah, I do. Now is works in the State Department in Vietnam and is having twins. Oh. She's married to a State Department, other person in the State Department, and they brought her back from Vietnam during this incubation period because of that the kinds of dangers, thing. yeah. yeah. Uh, small world. Let's talk about uh, perspiration a little bit, about what makes you sweat. And what I, I, I wanna talk a little bit about, you brought with you today the book that you've written, yeah. uh, Dead Center, uh, which has gotten wonderful reviews and uh, but, and we're gonna talk about that more in a second, but your vote on the Affordable Care Act was one of the things that, that many believe uh, contributed to your not being able to stay in Congress. Why don't you tell the story, and I think it's 
it's worth telling. I tell the story in great detail in the book. Okay. So anyone who's listening and is interested, and I know there are a lot of people who are interested in that story, um, it actually did not uh, result in me leaving Congress. It resulted in me getting a third term in Congress <laughs> because had I voted for the ACA, I would definitely have lost in 2010, as 63 of my colleagues did in the biggest electoral landslide in right. 72 years. So I don't look at it that way. Now, two years later, after redistricting, um, when the advantage was in the, that Johnstown area, as far as uh, me not being known, right. I had more geography, but they had the ability to define me. That was a huge factor in my defeat, but it would not have been possible without redistricting. Well, certainly, I mean, your, your vote um, was, there was a lot of pressure, and I, and I will encourage people to read the, the account in the book. But uh, the president and uh, his chief of staff were Everybody. really putting a lot of pressure on you to, to vote last, because of your experience in the healthcare field. Yeah, the last two weeks before, there was a lot that happened before this, but cutting to the chase, last two weeks before the vote, I was at the White House five times. The president called me twice in that time period. He had called me a third time earlier. And uh, yeah, they have everybody you've ever met, everyone who gave you money, everybody you're close to, every cabinet secretary that you have a good relationship with, they call you and they lean on you. I tell a story in the book, they had Dan Rooney lean on me. I was invited to the, he was the ambassador to Ireland during the Obama administration, and they invited me to the Irish um, ball mm -hmm. on St. Patrick's Day. I'm not Irish, and mm -hmm. I'd never <laughs> been invited before, and I kind of knew why they were inviting me. It was the week of the vote. And then, you know, Ambassador Rooney pulled me aside, and I'll tell that story. But this is what it comes down to. In every vote, I cast over 5,000 votes, you have to make a decision based upon three things. How does the issue you're voting on affect the district that you represent? 750,000 people, in my case, 146 towns, how are they affected? Then, what's the mood of the district? You are representing those people, that you're their voice in Washington. I served in the U.S. House of Representatives. My title was representative, mm -hmm. and that was my title for a reason. The way the Constitution is set up, the difference between the House and the Senate, the House is supposed to be responsive to the people. They respond with urgency to the will of the people. Those are two factors. And then the third is how do you feel about it, mm -hmm. right? You learn about the issue. This was my professional background. It was an issue I knew better than any other issue. Not like when we, t when we talked about dairy pricing, for agriculture, I needed help with that, mm -hmm. right? Healthcare, I knew pretty well, but I still listened to everybody and listened to advice. And it, I came to the conclusion th on those three things, all would have, I would have been inclined to vote no. Mm -hmm. I didn't think the bill did as much to reduce costs as it could have. I've definitely been proven right about that. Uh, the mood of the district was overwhelmingly unfavorable, even among Democrats. There was a poll taken by people who wanted to run a primary against me, mm -hmm. which leaked to me, and I saw it. And 53% of Democrats opposed the bill, and certainly 100% of Republicans opposed mm -hmm. it. And then lastly, the district I represented, how they're impacted, I had more Medicare Advantage recipients than any other district in the country, number one in the entire country. Mm -hmm the bill, now the law, cut Medicare Advantage by $150 billion. And I had among the least number of uninsured in the district. Paradoxically to what you might think about towns like Newcastle and, and uh, Beaver Falls and, mm -hmm. and Aliquippa, the reason is they were on Medicaid. So I had a lot of senior citizens who were on Medicare. I had uh, underserved communities that were on Medicaid, and then I had the wealthy suburbs of Pittsburgh on the other side, and they were insured through the work. I, I didn't have a lot of uninsured. So what the bill did was take money from the constituents I was elected to represent and give it to somebody else's constituents. Mm -hmm. That's pretty hard to explain when you go home, yeah. right? So all three of those things led me to vote no. And, and I really felt badly about it. In the last conversation I had with the president, the night that I announced I was a no vote, three days before the vote, he ended the call by saying, I want you to think about something over the weekend leading up to the vote. And I mm -hmm. said, what is that? He said, well, you're going to wake up the day after the vote, and you're going to pick up the newspaper, and every newspaper in the country, the headline is going to be, we passed this monumental, most significant piece of legislation in the past 50 years. Then you're going to go into your office and you're going to sit behind your big desk 
and you're going to watch TV and every station in the country, every commentator is going to be talking about this amazing piece of legislation that we passed, biggest accomplishment of the Democratic Party since Lyndon Johnson. And I want you to think about how you're going to feel knowing you weren't on the team. Right? That was the last That'll conversation. That'll keep you up at night. Yeah. So on, I tell this story in the book. So on the floor, the bill passes. I vote no. The Democrats are all celebrating. And these are my friends, yeah. right? These are my colleagues, people I came into Congress with, people I have a personal relationship with. And they're high-fiving each other and having fun. And Michelle Bachman, who I think everyone, your viewers know, is a very eccentric uh, mm -hmm. character, right, who was also a friend of mine, comes up and she's sobbing. And the mascara is running down her face. And she said, I just want to thank you for voting against this monstrosity. This is the worst thing that's ever happened, and I don't know how the country's going to survive. Just saying things like yeah. that. And uh, it was at that moment that in my mind I started to think, yeah, I, the president was right. I don't, I don't feel great. I don't feel like I was part of the team. But I do feel like I made the right vote for my district. And even though the ACA has worked and people are happy with it and there are millions of Americans that are benefiting from it, and I think it was a good thing that it passed. Mm -hmm. I think the vote that I cast, I was doing my job. Yeah. I really believe I was representing my district. Yeah, it sounds to me like the balancing of conscience and constituency on both sides had weighed in favor of the vote that, that you, you made. Yeah, it was and, a difficult, and, and a my supporters vote. were very disappointed, of course, but so often when you hear about people who only cast votes because somebody gave them money right. or because they have a personal relationship with somebody, right. that's the opposite of what I did. I knew the vote that I cast was going to irritate the people who supported me, and it wasn't really going to help me with the people who opposed me. They were right. still going to oppose me, but in the end, that 2010 election proved to be fatal for dozens of people that I served with. Yes. So had I voted for it, I never would have had a chance to run in that 2012 election because I wouldn't have been in Congress. So let's uh, let's talk just a little bit more about the book, and we've touched on it, Dead Center. How political? Can I? We Absolutely, please. We have uh, yep. most shows we have show and tell. You've actually bought the book itself, yeah. which uh, I think you can. You'll be able to. Carl will be able to zero in on that. Um, it's been called an incisive, intellectually thorough analysis of one of the country's most pressing political problems. So my question for you, is the country polarized or just are just our politics polarized? That, that's the question that I try to answer. And the question when I go out and speak, I get most often is why is there so much partisanship in Washington? Because mm -hmm. people feel like they want Congress to get along and compromise and get things done and make accommodations. That's not what's happening. And the reason Congress is so polarized is because we elect partisans. We have a system that's designed to elect and protect people on the extremes. And when you elect folks from the middle, as happened in my case and the case of so many of my colleagues, when you do talk to the other side and you vote with the other side occasionally or you are known to compromise, they'll punish you for it. Your own party will come after you because that's not what they want you to do. Mm -hmm. What I found out in losing a Democratic primary is when you vote half the time with the Republicans, I was a Democrat, but half the time with the other party, in the general election, that's really good. People like that. Mm -hmm. But the people who like that don't vote in primaries. Mm -hmm. The people who vote in primaries are on the extremes. And I get into the book all the reasons why that is. So. The gist of the problem is we have to reform the way we run primaries to incentivize candidates to appeal across the whole spectrum and get more people to vote in primaries rather than only appealing to the people on the extremes. Because if that's your base of support in primaries, if that's who you're accountable for, you're not going to want to work with the other side because compromise is a dirty word and you're going to be punished if you do. Mm -hmm. What And what are the things that we can do to get more people to vote? Is it, is it teaching civics in school or what, what are the things that we I can have, do? I have, I'm so glad you said it. I have so many interesting things about civics. Um, all of these surveys that you see where people are, are ill-informed about the history of America, about the Constitution, about current events and public policy. Mm -hmm. And what you find, what I do in the book is I mix psychoanalysis and, and social science into the way partisans think. Really interesting studies in group dynamics and how people react in different circumstances. Um, if you present somebody who's certain of their view, if you present them with evidence conclusively proving their view is wrong, mm -hmm. what will they do and, and how will they act around other people? Really cool stuff. 
I weave that in with the problems that people think cause polarization, partisan media, gerrymandering, campaign finance, and I weave throughout the story anecdotes from my career and a lot of stuff about Pittsburgh because that's where I'm from and that was my frame of reference. So I do mini biographies on people from Pittsburgh, people like John DeFazio, mm -hmm. you know, it just had a really interesting story, but a very partisan person mm -hmm. with a good history, an interesting history. Um, Newcastle, I profile the history of Newcastle and I talk about, you know, the industrial Midwest that decided the 2016 election. Why have their politics changed and what? So I analyze all of that and bring it all together in a way that I think it, it, it presents a really good story and I set that for the last chapter which is solutions. You have to know what the problems are to know what your solutions are. And the solutions, what I found out having lost my seat in large part because of gerrymandering, mm -hmm. gerrymandering is not the problem. Mm -hmm. And those other issues I mentioned are not the problem. They're symptoms. Mm -hmm. They're not causing the problem. The problem is closed primaries. If you look at states that have opened up the primaries where everyone can vote. Like in California. California is the perfect example. California did two things. They went to independent commissions to draw their congressional and legislative districts, mm -hmm. no more gerrymandering. And they went to an open primary system where everyone, libertarians, greens, republicans, democrats, they're all in the same primary. And if you're a candidate running for office in that primary and you come in with an extreme message, you're toast. And there were people who had served for decades that had never lost, never been challenged, and were representing the same district, mm -hmm. and they lost because the electorate looked different. It wasn't the same electorate. Right. And the people who survived had to moderate their message. And now, we don't usually use California as the model for the rest of the country because mm -hmm. it's such a unique part of the country and it's not applicable. But their state legislature has had turnover. People have lost and they brought in new blood and the people who have stayed have become more moderate. And the same has happened among their congressional delegation. So that's really the answer, getting more people to vote and setting primaries in a way that it levels the playing field for centrists so you're not presented in the general election with only two people on the extremes. Hmm. The Supreme Court this week uh, heard yeah. arguments on the gerrymandering case from Wisconsin. Yeah. Do you think that uh, would have do you have a sense of where the Supreme Court might, might go on that? Well, I'm very hopeful that they will do the right thing and do away with gerrymandering and, <laughs> and make it more fair. Because th the crux of gerrymandering is it, yeah. it's, it's anathema to what we're supposed to be doing in this country with voters. Instead of voters deciding who their leaders are, we have a system now where the leaders decide who their voters mm -hmm. are going to be. Yeah. And they draw the line specifically for their own benefit so they can win re-elect. Clearly not what we're supposed to be doing. So the argument is correct, but we have a Supreme Court that probably is skeptical of that argument. So we'll see. I'm not. Yeah. I wouldn't say I'm optimistic, but I'm hopeful. Now you wrote this book when you were senior vice president of of uh, the Florida Blues. Right. Did you did you like when you ran for Congress? Did you leave your job to go write the book, or uh, how did you get this thing? So done? I, I had been writing the book for about two years. And I, in the end, I realized that I was, if I wanted to do it right, if I put out a book, right, I could just put my thoughts on paper and put them in a file or maybe do an op-ed, and that's cool. But if I do a book, I want to do it right, mm -hmm. right? I've got a publisher, I want to go out, I want to, I want to promote it and talk about it and talk about the issue because it's very important to me. Yeah. So I decided to leave my job, but I made that decision about a year and a half ago after the Pulse shooting in Orlando. Okay. I wasn't done with the book yet, I was still writing it, and I hadn't even really decided if it was even gonna be a book, but when that happened, the reason it affected me, A, it was close, it was, it was very close uh, geographically, because I'm in Florida, but the, well, I, the introduction to my book is about the public reaction to the shooting. Horrific, 49 people killed, 68 injured, you know, the close venue, and the unique circumstances where you had a gay nightclub, a Muslim, an American-born Muslim shooter. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't know at the time how he got the weapons. He had all these things that were political, hot button, mm -hmm. all at once wrapped around a tragedy. And when you go back and you look at the political statements that were made and the social media statements were made, it's sickening that 
as soon as the news came down, people were pointing fingers and casting blame and positioning for political advantage, trying to decide whose fault it was and how they can make the other side look bad. And while all of that was happening, you saw the best of America. You saw people donating blood, waiting hours in line. You saw people giving more money than they were able to give to help the families of the victims. Yes. You saw all of these vigils around the country. So you saw these this polar opposite reaction where you saw the best of America and the worst of America. And it really touched me in a way that when I wrote that introduction, I said, you know what, this is, this is the microcosm of our political process. Mm -hmm. Most people are normal folks. They're not extreme. Right. So you started this interview, is America polarized or just politics? America's not polarized, even though that's, that's the narrative right now. Most people want to know who are the Steelers going to play this week? What activity does my kid have tonight? What's my work week look like? What time's church start on Sunday, right? Yeah. That's what they're thinking. But the people in Washington and the people that are absorbed in the political process, to them it's a game. It's win or lose. It's not about good public policy. It's about making the other side look bad. Yeah. And while they're having this argument, the rest of America sits back and looks with disgust and thinks, why can't you get anything done? And the reason they can't get anything done is because the people who participate in the political process are on the fringe. And that's what the book is about, how we get to a system where we solve that problem. I hope people read the book yeah. <laughs> and show up to solve the problem because we're obviously in the aftermath of the Las Vegas shooting, which is, and there has to be a way for people in, in, in the middle can find a way to do something constructive to right. stop this kind of thing from happening. What, what do you think of groups like No Labels, Nancy Jacobson's group that has sort of taken sort of the center and become a, a really influential uh, voice in Congress? And, trying to get things done. Well, as we tape this today, I know it's going to be shown multiple times, uh, as we tape this today, I actually am going to be on the No Labels radio program when we're done taping. Oh, great. And I'm working with them, and they're very excited about the book, and we are going to do some joint promotional opportunities because it's exactly in line with the message that they're trying to send. Yes. All right, so uh, we know what uh, keeps you up at night. We know what makes you sweat. We, uh, what do you want to be when you grow up, Jason? There's a... Uh, you're uh, you're now you're no longer with the Florida Blue. Right. You're, you're promoting the book. You're an author. Are you are you a are you a, uh, a legislator? Are you an author? Are you what's next? I'm not going to run for office again. Right. I, I can't imagine a scenario where I would want to wake up and start making fundraising calls again <laughs> and, and you know face the negativity that's I just I, I don't I don't that doesn't appeal to me. What what I found with my job was I had a great job. I enjoyed it. I was committed to the healthcare, and, and, and I talked about the charitable mission, but um, I was getting soft, you know? We live at the beach, and, and we're, <laughs> we're loving life, and it's all good, and I'm What's four, left of the beach after Irma? Now, yeah, but I, so I'm 49 years old, and I just kind of had to decide, is this what I want to do? Yeah. For this? And maybe it is, I, you know, I could be happy, and you know, I was well compensated, but then I, you know, I, I, I'm passionate about this idea of, of bringing the country together and, and we're not polarized and you know all the things we've been talking about. So mm -hmm. I had to decide and I decided to leave my job and I don't know what's going to come next. I'm going to spend six or eight months traveling around and we'll see. I may go back into the business community. I've, I have some success as, as a business executive so mm -hmm. we'll see how that goes. Or I might like to go into teaching like uh, college uh, political science. I, I could teach both healthcare and, and political science and do that and maybe do some speaking and writing on the side, which would be more, I think, what I would like to do. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, my family probably would benefit a little bit more if I did the other part. So I don't know what it's going to be, but uh, but uh, I just felt like this was the right thing to do. I'm committed to the message and I'm passionate about trying to find a way to bridge that divide in the country, and we'll just see where it goes. Well, it certainly is a, a healthy way to deal with a midlife crisis. So uh, maybe very that's constructive, what it was, right? Yeah. No. I don't mean to minimize, it's really important work that, that you've embarked on. So now this is the fun part of the show, we call it Rapid Response, where it's sort of binary world, I give you choices, you choose one or the other. Okay. We may have conversation about it, we may not, it's not required. Okay. All right. Uh, the, the categories this week uh, are blue, blue, my world is blue, mm -hmm. um, considering all of your work in healthcare and for the blues and yeah. otherwise. And, and they called him The Streak, which I think that song was... Yeah, see, I want to know how this applies to me. Yeah, well, <laughs> we're, we're going to get to that because in honor of 
your voting record in the House, oh, which they should, yes. to this day is I, the, the current holder of the most consecutive votes in Congress um, is is uh, still 500 votes from where where you were when your record was broken. Yeah. So that that's why we're calling it. Thank you. Yeah, that was good. Okay, good. Um, all right, here we go. So blue dogs or bulldogs, as in Georgia. I know, I'm thinking mm -hmm. about that. Well, it could also be Mississippi State. I, I would mm -hmm. say Bulldogs. I'm a Florida State fan, but I love college football. Politics is behind me, at least engage, public engagement in it. I like college football, we'll go with Bulldogs. Yeah, even though you went to Florida State, when you live in Jacksonville, it's, you know, how about them dogs, right? That's where it's not necessarily hey, Gainesville or... Anyone who's watching this, put on your bucket list the Florida-Georgia game in Jacksonville. There is no better atmosphere for college football. You gotta do it. I, I go every year, it's, it's an amazing atmosphere. Excellent. All right, Rivers, St. John's or Allegheny? The St. John's the River. I grew up on the Allegheny. North I love Pittsburgh, but the St. John's River is an awesome river. It flows north, which is kind of cool. It's rare. I know the Yacht yeah. does too, but um, it's just big and it's massive and it dumps out right into the ocean. So St. John's is a cool river. It, people who don't know about it, look it up. It's All pretty right. cool. Jimmy Buffett or Donnie Iris and the Jaggers? Oh man, see, I love Johnny, the Donny Iris, mm -hmm. but Jimmy Buffett is is awesome, and he's he's Florida. And um, talk about getting soft, right? Yeah. That's what I was worried about turning into <laughs> is that kind of thing. Um, but love is like a rock. I love Donny Iris. Too. We'll go with uh, Margaritaville. I, we should tell people the St. John's River runs through Jacksonville. That's right. right. That's that's where the St. John's River. Is. Uh, one of my best friends in the world, Stephen Presser, grew up in Jacksonville, went to Bowles, and that's how come that's I know Jacksonville yeah. inside now. Yeah. Um, Joe Grishecki or Tom Petty? Got it. Had to I'm a huge a Tom, Tom Petty, Petty fan, and as we take this, we're three or four days after he died, and um, yeah. uh, it's much too soon. He had a concert here. I went to his last concert here. It was incredible. Really going to miss miss him. I, I, I really like his music. Tom Petty or Richard Petty? Tom Petty. I, I'm not an NASCAR guy. Okay. Yeah. So now you know I'm never running for office. I, I just it just proved it. There, we've got it. He, Richard Petty won Daytona 500 seven times. Yeah. And, and sp speaking of streaks, he uh, won 10 consecutive races in, in one year. He's the man, year. the king. The man. That's why he's called the king. That's, that's great. Yeah. All right, Disney World or Kennywood? Kennywood. Disney World, huge, awesome. They have a great wine festival that my wife and I like to partake in, but Kennywood's got character. Do the girls remember Kennywood? They do. They Good. both do, yeah. Good. They actually, I didn't do it, but they actually wanted me to steal a Kennywood sign or, <laughs> or somehow procure a Kennywood sign on <laughs> we'll, the way we'll out of time, but yeah, we never did. All right, universe, well, since we're on this Florida kick, Universal Studios or Universal Healthcare? Well, they're very different. Um, <laughs> I, I, I would like to find a way to cover everybody in the country, and healthcare is my background, so how you get there, the devil's in the details, but yeah, it would be nice if we could cover everybody. Is a, a single payer something that you think is even conceivable or something you would support? I would have said no until recently, and, and what happens is, uh, one of my favorite quotes in politics is, there's nothing more permanent than a temporary government program. Milton Friedman. Hmm. And what that means is once you give people something, you're not going to be able to take it away. Yeah. And when we were debating the ACA, remember, we couldn't even do the public option in a climate in which the Democrats controlled everything mm -hmm. because the public wasn't comfortable with the idea of having a government-run system compete against the private insurers. But now that's changed. The outlook has changed because people are much more comfortable with government intervention because the exchanges in the ACA have worked mm -hmm. to cover people. So it's not today, it's not politically possible today, but I, I would say, now I would not have said this five years ago, but I really do think that's where we're evolving to. I think if we fast forward, let's say 20 years down the road, I think that's probably where we'll be. Hmm. That surprise you? Yeah, actually, and this is great. <laughs> I, uh, Obamacare or Trump care? Wow, that one's easy. Yeah. That, that was okay. the whole Milton Friedman okay. quote. The Republicans yeah. found out you, you can't it. take it away. There you go. Highmark Blue or UPMC? Well, I worked at UPMC and I, I'm out of that game, right? I haven't kept in touch with that whole um, rivalry that's going on. Yeah. 
but I think you have to have both. You have to have a balance. It's not a cop-out. You really do have yeah. to have a comp competitive market. Well, when you figure all this out, speaking of polarization, you yeah. can come back and bring the blue, Highmark and UPMC together, and you'll be, you'll be king. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sam Houston or Daniel Webster? Now you're asking why am I asking about Sam Houston or Daniel Webster? What, you know what they have in common? I know who they are. I don't know what, what do they have in common. Well, they were both people in Congress, like you, yeah. alumni, who served in two states. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so Sam Houston, Tennessee and Texas. Uh, Daniel Webster, he was a Whig, New Hampshire and Massachusetts. Now, you've served in Pennsylvania. Why not in Florida, too? There are others who've served in two states. There were a lot of people in the early days when they were breaking up states and forming new states, but if you mm -hmm. take them out, okay. um, there are people who were elected in two different states. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to, I, I don't plan on running again. All right. All right. Seminoles or Chuck Knoll? I'm Florida. I love Chuck Knoll. Steelers in the 70s, four rings, it's great, but I, you know, that wasn't, I wasn't a part of that. I was a fan, right? Yeah. That's not personal to me. Florida State's Seminole. personal Seminoles or Chuck yeah. Knoll. All right, Seminoles. All right. Johnny Majors or Bobby Bowden? Bobby Bowden. Well, oh, that's why would I, I? Johnny Majors, great coach, but, yeah. but like, I played for Bobby Bowden, right? So right, right, right. That's my did, guy. did Pitt try to recruit you? Johnny Majors was when you were uh, yeah. Pitt. I, I was recruited by Pitt in West Virginia and the local schools. But um, this is more interesting. When Johnny Majors left yes. and they were trying to replace him, and I'm sure there's people out there that know this story. Bobby Bowden was the other finalist when Jackie Sherrill got the job. Ah. Didn't so if they had made a different decision and Bobby Bowden would have been Pitt's coach, the two programs would look very different. To Florida State would have never Absolutely. become who they are. Well, of course, people who aren't from Florida, when, if you to help them understand uh, the way that Joe Pa was the king of Penn State, Bobby Bowden is, is the king of Tallahassee, that whole region. Oh, it's indescribable. Those. Yeah, and he's just a great guy. Very nice, warm guy, knows everybody in town. You see mm -hmm. him out. It's just a, a good guy. Fantastic. All right, uh, you were a wide receiver. Stallworth or Swan? I w both Hall of Famers, a fan of both, um, but Stallworth was always somebody that I identified a little bit more with because Swan just had the athletic ability. To, he, he seemed superhuman, right? Yep. Um, yep. Stallworth seemed like a, more of a normal guy who was just a really good player. And then Lynn Swan almost ran against me when I was in office. So that, that kind of colors my view yeah, a little just, bit. Just a little. Yeah. <laughs> but good guy and doing really well at, U, at USC now. Uh, now, you, Larry Fitzgerald or, or Antonio Brown? Well, Larry Fitzgerald's awesome. I would say right now Larry Fitzgerald, but Antonio Brown is great too. Yeah. Right? The question right now in NFL history is Larry Fitzgerald or Jerry Rice, right? Antonio Brown, if he continues on his current pace, he'll put himself in that category for sure. You were at the University of Pittsburgh when, when Larry was uh, on the team, right? Where UPMC. I worked well, for UPMC. UPMC. But, yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. All right. Just two more. Well, I know you've been in... It's actually more fun than I thought it was going to be. Come on, Jason. <laughs> it's a reunion. We have to have fun. All right. All right. Colbert or John Oliver? Oh, I did Colbert. I know. Yeah, That's I why I'm asking you the question. I got to go with that one. Yeah. We had fun. Do you I, watch John Oliver? I do. Yeah, he's funny. Yeah. My wife loves him. Yeah. I think he's a little over the top, but, but he's, he's entertaining. Yeah. Yeah. And I tell the story in the book about my Colbert, Colbert interview, and it, I think it's one of the highlights of the book. Oh, excellent. So I, I don't know if I should ask you this or not, but Colbert or Political Jungle? Political Jungle. Good, good answer. All right. <laughs> Jason Altmeyer, thank you for thank uh, you. trying to tackle this problem that's so core to our Democratic Republic and for making Pittsburgh a stop on your tour of your, your book. I can't wait to read it. Uh, and whether in D.C. or Florida, you are always welcome, Jason Altmaier, in the political jungle. Thank you, Steve. All right, Glad buddy. to be here. Thanks.